All of us know that have read the Bibles and especially the four Gospels that in order for Jesus Christ and even the prophets that had gone before him to convey to the people spiritual truths, they had to use analogies and Jesus became famous for using what they called parables. They used analogies that made use of things that people could understand. When Jesus met the woman at the well, for instance, the woman was coming to get physical water. Water was a necessity. She came out and she carried the water back into the town and she knew what water was for. She knew the value of water. And Jesus did not begin to talk to her about some super spiritual something in the sky that she couldn't relate to. Jesus talked to her about water that she could understand. When the apostles went forth and began to preach, the apostle Paul being one of them, he began to talk about things that people could understand. And he found himself at one point chained in Rome in jail between a quaternion of soldiers. And as he was chained there, probably sitting on the floor or on his bench, he looked up and he saw the classical Roman dress of a Roman soldier. He had a helmet on. He had a breastplate. His breastplate was tied to the lower part of his uniform with a, a girdle. He had a sword, he had a shield, and he had sandals on. And Paul took the opportunity to present some spiritual truths based on those natural things that he observed there. And he started with the helmet. And in Ephesians 6, turn over there, praise God. These were some things that we absolutely fed on in the early days until they became concrete truths in our hearts. As you put your finger in Ephesians 6 and go back to Ephesians 1, because I want to preface this by saying something to you. When the Apostle Paul began writing to this church that had, was, had already been established at Ephesus, he opened it by greeting them, of course, and saying, Grace be unto you. But the very first thing he said to them in verse 3 was, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, past tense, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And then he began to enumerate some of the blessings. He says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and having predestinated us unto the adoption. And he goes on down this whole 10 or more verses talking about what this church at Ephesus is, how they have been blessed and what they have. Then he goes on in the 16th and 17th verses to pray for them that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened so that they would come to know what their calling is and what the riches of the glory of the inheritance of God is in the saints. And also that they would come to understand what is his exceeding great power towards those who can believe according to the working of the mighty power, he said, which God wrought when he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And this is the part I want you to get. Far above all principality. Let's stop right there and explain that principality. Everybody say this. A principality, a principality. is an area, an area. Of, dominion. of dominion. Any area of dominion can be called a principality. Technically, you could call the United States a principality because it's an area that is governed. It is governed by the United States government, reinforced by the military and the wealth of the United States and the people. So it in, it, it in fact is an area of authority. But that is a natural area of authority and there are spiritual as well as natural areas of authority. There are only two. There is the holy spiritual realm of authority, and there's the unholy spiritual realm of authority. And in the 21st verse, Paul tells us beyond the shadow of a doubt that Christ has been raised from the dead and sat at the Father's right hand far above any principality, all principality, all power, 
all might, all dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the one which is to come. And he hath put everything under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Christ is the head over everything to the church. There's no area of authority that is not under Christ in his church. Everything comes under him. Amen. Any authority is under him. And all bishops, everybody, the Pope is under Christ. I mean, come on now. And he says, he's put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his. The church is Christ's body. The church is the fullness of Christ. And the church fills all in all, which means the church is worldwide. It's universal. It's all over the world. Now let's go to Ephesians 6 and begin reading in verse 10. I read that to you because that's how he started his letter. And everything in between chapters 2, 3, 4, 5 are a continuation of the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit expanding on his message to the church and exalting Christ as the head of the church. Are you with me? In chapter 6, he begins by ta telling the children to obey their parents, to honor their father and mother, and so on and so forth. And he gets down to verse 10 and he says, Finally, what's finally mean to you? After everything else that I have said, Starting from chapter 1, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, we already saw in chapter 1 what his might is like, right? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And looking up at these natural soldiers, he began to make a spiritual comparison. He said, put on the whole armor, not of the Roman Empire, but of God, all right? That she may be able to stand against the wiles, that word W-I-L-E-S means the deceptions and the deceit of the devil. So what we know now, we don't have to read any further, we know the devil doesn't have power, he's got deceit. We know he doesn't have might, he's got trickery. So we are to put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against his trickery. For, notice this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. What is a principality? An area of authority and dominion. We wrestle against areas of authority and dominion. We wrestle against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual or wicked spirits in high or heavenly places. That's what we're up against. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, <laughs> when you get finished doing everything else, stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, not with falsehood, but with truth, not with error, but with truth. Not in I think so or my mama said, but with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness or being justified in the sight of God and your feet shod, your feet shod, having your shoes on, having your combat boots on, your spiritual combat boots have to do with being prepared with the gospel of peace. And above all, Taking, oh, that's an interesting way to put it, not having, that means you've got to do something about putting the shield of faith in place. You just don't automatically have it. And taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer, which means that, that there are different kinds of prayer, and supplication, that word means petition, in the Spirit, and watching there in the Spirit mean, doesn't mean just in tongues, it means whenever you pray, be in the Spirit of prayer. Amen? 
and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication or petition for all saints. And he adds a postscript and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now that's what you all need to be praying for Pastor Sarah and myself and anybody that ministers in the body of Christ, that boldness would be given to us that we would open our mouths boldly to declare the truth openly as we should. Now, I want you to understand, I said this during the Revelation series, that everything that happens in this world there's something spiritual behind it. It's either for good or it's for evil. There is no neutral ground. One of the reasons I'm starting this message this way is because there are people who come into the body of Christ and they're baby Christians and they've been exposed to art and they've been exposed to literature and they've been exposed to a lot of different things and they think there are a lot of things in this world that are just, you know, things I like to do, things I like to involve myself. There are no harm. Honey, I'm telling you, if it isn't lending itself towards the things of God, it's lending itself towards the devil. Now, am I advocating you're not being literate? Of course not. But what I am saying is when you go into foreign countries and you pick up all kinds of artifacts and carvings and all kinds of things that you don't know the origin of, you don't know what you're bringing back into your house. Amen? Do you understand me? That is why when you read in the writings of the Apostle Paul, I think it was at Ephesus, I may be mistaken about this, where the people brought their curious artifacts and books and burned them. They brought them and burned them because they were of the devil. They talked about the devil. They enhanced the worship of the devil. And as some of you sitting right here have some things in your house that need to be, they don't need to be in the garbage where somebody else can pick it up and read it. You need to burn the thing. I went in the Wiz the other day to get a video for my granddaughter. And I hadn't been in a store like that in some time. And you know, they have the little uh, things up there to tell you what kind of music is in this section. So they had popular music and they had country and Western. And here was a whole section I'd never seen before. New age music. Whole new section. Amen because they're exporting this particular kind of stuff that seems innocent enough. But when you get interested in that, then you get interested in what they believe. And when you get interested in what they believe, you're going to find out it's straight from the pits of hell. Anything to draw you away from the true spirit of God. So the demonic spirits that were loosed when Satan fell arranged according to the word of God in the atmosphere around the earth. Just like we have an envelope of atmosphere, we have an envelope of spiritual power. And there are principalities or areas of authority that are, that are just like in the army. When I was in the army, there was a table of organization and it went, we went from a squad to a company to uh, several companies in a, a battalion, I think it was, and several battalions in a, I forget it now, several battalions in a, in a, uh, well, it was a company and then a platoon and s several platoons made up a company. That's the way it went. Squad, a platoon, several platoons made up a company, several companies made up a, 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 a regiment and regiments made up a division and divisions made up an army. And just like that level of authority moved up from the smallest unit to a, a combination of these units is the way that Ephesians was talking about Christ was placed over the principalities and the wicked spirits and the rulers. You understand? There are spiritual rulers ranged around this planet that influence the... I, I, I'll give you a reference. Remember when I talked about the seven Gentile empires? Well, there were demonic spirits that were designated by Satan himself to influence these various empires. How do you know that, Pastor? Because when Daniel was in Babylon and he was praying, the angel came 
and said that the prince of Persia withstood him. It wasn't a man. It was a prince of demons assigned to that particular empire. And he said, if you know anything about your history, that he had to go because the prince of Grecia was coming. Well, everybody has any kind of history book at all knows that Greece came after Persia and conquered Persia. And there was a demonic prince that controlled that next nation. So these are principalities, areas of spiritual authority. You listening? All right. So these demonic spirits are, 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 are arranged around the atmosphere over the earth, and their organizational structure or chain of command runs from principalities, which is areas of authority, to the rulers of the darkness of this age. And in Ephesians 6 that we just read, the whole armor of God is the power of his might. Say that. All right. So if the whole armor of God is the power of God's might, putting on the armor is the way that a believer is going to walk in the spirit and be able to stand against the wiles of the devil by having on the whole armor of God. So the apostle Paul begins to explain to us that even though these demonic spirits are ranged around and they would appear to have power, the believer with the whole armor of God on is the real power in this universe. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ is in charge of this army. All right? So when the eyes of our understanding that the Apostle Paul talked about in Ephesians 1, when the eyes of our understanding become enlightened, and that's why we come here, and that's why it's important to have a teachable spirit. Because if you walk in a place and somebody begins to show you the holy word of God and prove it to you by the spirit, and you have a spirit of resistance, you are not going to be able to grab a hold of that truth and use it in your life because you got your own agenda. But when you come in some place like this and somebody proves something to you out of the word of God, you need to grab it like a bulldog with a bone. And thank God there were a number of people who did that when we first got started. And some of those people are still here today and are pillars of the organization. All right? So the whole armor of God is going to allow you to walk in the spirit. When the eyes of your understanding become enlightened, you're going to see. You're going to actually be able to understand and comprehend that Christ is the head of the church. And he is positioned above all of the spiritual powers. I don't care what new thing somebody comes up with. If God didn't invent it, Jesus is over it. I said if God didn't invent it and put it into motion and into play, then Jesus Christ has authority over it. I don't care what they call it. All right? All right. The whole armor of God is the authority that is in Christ in the church. Everybody say that. The whole armor of God, whole armor of God is, is the, authority the authority that is in Christ. Is in Christ. Say in Christ. in Christ. In Christ. I want to emphasize in Christ because that's where everything is. The power is in Christ. All the things that we have in him, redemption, sanctification, all the things that we have in Christ comprise the power that we bring to bear against the demonic forces that are in this world. Another thing, you're not going to be able to send the devil back to hell. You're not going to be able to assign the demons and tell them where to go. Satan is operating Adam's lease, and he has until Adam's lease is over. He has the right to be here. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, one of the things that Satan said to him is very important for you to understand. He said, all of the kingdoms of this world I will give to you. Was Satan lying to Jesus? By no means. He had the kingdoms of this world, and he could have given them to him because he's the God of this world system. He's not the God of this world. He's the God of this world system. God is still the God of this world. All right, but he is operating Adam's lease and Jesus came so that we would get back the authority that Adam lost when he gave it away. Is that clear to you? 
Adam lost his authority. In Genesis 1, God said, let us make man after our own image and after our own likeness and let them have dominion. So that meant that the earth was to be the principality of mankind. And man was supposed to have dominion in that area of authority. And when he lost it, Satan now has dominion in this earth realm, which is why his demonic hordes arranged around the planet. Amen. But he's not by himself. Yeah. <laughs> because when Jesus rose from the dead and became the firstborn of many brethren, as soon as people start getting born again, angels were assigned to them. And so the demons are not by themselves. Amen. Amen. All right. I wanted to lay that groundwork for you because sometimes when we just jump into talking about salvation and the message tonight is the helmet of salvation because of this. The whole armor of God is the authority that is in Christ and in the church, I said, and the whole armor of God is the power of God's might. And the spirit man, everybody say this with me, the spirit man, spirit man. gets dressed, gets dressed. Beginning, with his helmet, beginning with his helmet and proceeding down to his feet. Now, I know when you get dressed, you don't put your hat on first and nothing else. You know, most people don't, although I've seen some people get dressed in some funny ways. But anyway, the spirit man gets dressed with his helmet first. Does everybody understand that? And salvation, I want you to say this with me, salvation, salvation. Means, more means more than eternal life. Than eternal life. So let's talk about it tonight, the helmet of salvation. Now go to Matthew, the first chapter. We're familiar with this. We've just come through the Christmas season, so this is an appropriate place to start. Matthew 1.21 says, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And of course, Jesus is the Greek for Yehoshua, which means salvation. So the angel actually told them to call his name salvation, because he will save his people from their sins. So the first thing that salvation is for us, it's spiritual and is eternal. Say salvation is spiritual, salvation is spiritual. and salvation is, eternal. salvation is eternal. In other words, salvation covers us in the spirit realm and it's forever. You got that? Now, the first thing we need to talk about is the bondage of sin. Turn to Romans, the seventh chapter. When man lost his place, and these are the basic building blocks that helped us to understand faith because the whole authority of the believer is built on your ability to believe it. You remember when I said you have to take the shield of faith? You have to take the, field, the shield of faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the only way you can have faith for the things that I'm talking about tonight is that you have to hear it preached. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The first thing we need to know is that sin brought bondage. Everybody say sin brought bondage. Are you at Romans 7 yet? All right, I'm not. I'll be there in a minute. I decided to read it out of the New International. Romans the seventh chapter and verse 22. You've heard me talk about this uh, uh, many times, but I have to go back here. The Apostle Paul, everybody knows he was perfect, right? <laughs> I said that deliberately. In verse number 14, he's talking about the believer, and he's talking about himself. He includes himself. And he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. 
As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Did you get that? He's not talking about his spirit, man. He's talking about his flesh. When you get born again, sin still lives in your flesh. And if that's not true, then this Bible is not true, because that's what it says. It's sin living in his members, it says in the King James. He says in his flesh in the New International. Verse 18, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. Do you understand what he's talking about? For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Listen carefully now. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my, notice this, for in my inner being, that's his spirit, I delight in God's law. Isn't that true of you too? Nobody wants to sin in his spirit. If you've been, if you're, if you've been changed, if you've been born again. He said, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? He asks. Then he answers, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does that mean? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, I am rescued from the body of death that's trying to kill me off. Because the wages of sin is death. All right? He says, so then I myself in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. But in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of God, I've been to the law of sin. Let me say that again. So then I bought myself in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Everybody say, it's a law. When I say it's a law, I'm not talking about a law like it's written on the book, you know, you shouldn't cross the red light. I'm talking about a law like gravity, like centrifugal force. Better way to say it, it's a force. The law of gravity is a force, is it not? The law of centrifugal force is a force. The law of lift is a force. The law of thrust is a force. And the law of sin is a force. And so is the law of life. All right? So then he goes on to say, Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Notice the categories that he establishes. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Let me say that to you this way. I don't have a problem flying anymore because the law of thrust has superseded the law of gravity and gotten me off the ground. Got that? So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death that was trying to hold me down to this death-ridden body with its appetites. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that was imparted to me when I got born again has set me free, has cut me loose from the bondage of sin that was holding me down. You got that? All right. So the effect of sin is death. And this effect can still be found in our flesh or our members. And the only one who can deliver us from this death is Christ. And in him can be found the law or the force of the spirit of life. He is life. All right. <laughs> that is so important because people don't know. i tell you how... Some of the elders come to me sometimes, and, you know, we just generally think everybody goes to RLCC. They know all this stuff. No, they don't. 
People knew all the time come in and they come down for prayer and we say, have a scripture to stand on. They don't even know where to find the scripture, much less have a scripture to stand on. Don't even know that they're supposed to be praying the word of God. Don't even know how to pray. So we have to build the basic blocks of Christianity into the person. Christ has to be formed in us. Christ doesn't automatically be grown up in us just because we got born again. That is a starting point. We are babes in Christ. And we'll stay babes if Christ isn't formed in us. A baby Christian could be saved 40 years. That's why in some of those churches we came out of and people say, I've been in the way 40 years. And that was their problem. They've been in the way they need to get out of the way. Let somebody else do something that wanted to do something. All right? I know I've, I've, been, I've been in those kind of places. But go back with me to Romans, the fifth chapter. The helmet of salvation we're talking about, we get dressed from the helmet down first. In Romans, the fifth chapter and the eighth verse, it, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, makes this, uh, well, start at the sixth verse, New International. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, since we have now been justified, that means made righteous, by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Isn't that true? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, who was that one man? Say it loud. Adam. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sin, or, or that meant that all had sinned because Adam's, Adam sinned, and Adam is the one who sired the race. So that meant all had sinned. You got that? All right. To verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Isn't that wonderful? Because of only one sin, death came. But the free gift of salvation results in freedom from sin and death even though, and freedom from sin and from death, even though there has since been many sinners and many sins. All right? Go to John, the third chapter. Speaking of freedom from bondage, sin brought bondage. Is that right? Have we established that sin brought bondage? In John 3, this is that famous passage of Scripture where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and giving his explanation. And in verse number 14, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, we know the serpent in the wilderness was on a tree or on a pole. And Jesus says, in like manner, he must be lifted up. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Say everlasting life. He says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. 
People talking about the Christian right. People keep talking about the fact that we are, we, we are trying to impose our ideas on them. The scripture says God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the effect of freedom from bondage is eternal and everlasting life, which the world cannot understand. The world cannot understand everlasting life. The world doesn't understand eternal life. So that's why the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, has come to be the convincer. All that we can do is live our lives in a way that we will be an effective witness. When people see us, we won't be doing anything that will discourage them from becoming a Christian. But it's the Holy Spirit's job to actually convince them that there is such a thing as the spirit realm, first of all, and there is such a thing as eternal life. You'll never be able to convince them. All right? You'll never be able to convince them with your argument or your intellect. But the Holy Spirit working through you will be able to convince the person of the reality of what the scriptures have to say. But the effect of being freed from the bondage of sin is eternal and everlasting life. And this is in contrast to eternal and everlasting damnation. The gift of eternal life means that the spirit, you need to write this down somewhere, the spirit, the soul, and the body of man will live eternally. Spirit, soul, and body will live eternally. Everybody say spirit, soul, and body will live eternally. That's what eternal life is about. All right? Now, why would Paul admonish and advise the church at Ephesus to put on the whole armor of God? The whole armor. Why would he say that? Because salvation means more than just eternal life. Or you could put it another way. The helmet does more than just one thing. Everybody say the helmet does more than just one thing. Okay, we've talked about spiritual and eternal life. Now I want to talk about material and temporal life. Turn to Matthew, the eighth chapter. In Matthew, the eighth chapter, we see an account of Jesus and his disciples, one of the many accounts of the things that happened while Jesus was with his disciples. And in verse number 23 of the eighth chapter, and you're familiar with this. It says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? That's a tremendous statement. I don't know how big this ship was, but I do know that in those days they were fishing boats. They were not ocean liners because the Sea of Galilee is not a sea at all. It's a lake. All right? And the fishing boats must have been, you know, of moderate size. And so when the wind began to blow and the tempest and the waves began to kick up on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus must have been awful confident to be laying back asleep in the midst of that in a boat probably not that big, wouldn't you say? Jesus knew something they didn't know. And when they woke him and, 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 and uh, displayed a natural sense of fear, what did he say to them? Why are ye what? Why, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid, he said to them. O ye of little faith, he added. If I understand English at all, he's saying, if you had a little bit of faith, you wouldn't be afraid of this storm. Now, don't you know these are the same people that had seen him do the miracles? These are the same people that, I don't know the chronology, but they had seen him do the various miracles. I don't know which he had done by this time and which he hadn't, but they had seen him do miracles. And they knew he was a miracle worker and he went to sleep. I think if they had common sense at all, they would have said, well, if he sleep, we might as well sleep too. But their natural instincts took over because they did not have knowledge 
They did not have the knowledge that he was about to impart to them. Now notice. Notice what's hap what happens after that. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? I want to ask you a question. If Jesus was able to calm the seas while he was here in a physical body before he was glorified, and he did it for this little group, do you think he is disposed to protect those of us who are ministering the gospel of the kingdom of God all over the world in 1994? Do you think he's of the same disposition? If he saved a little boatload of disciples so that the gospel could be spread, do you think he's disposed to save in you in your little situation? Well, I say to you emphatically, yes, because salvation also carries with it the idea of divine protection. This was divine protection. The man got up and rebuked the storm. What was Jesus doing? Was he showing off? No, Jesus was demonstrating to them that I have taken back the authority that you lost when Adam sinned, and I'm exerting it right now because the wind is contrary. The wind is contrary to our well-being. And so if the wind is contrary to our well-being, then rebuke it. I tell you who's got the hang of it, Pastor Sarah. Every time we have a storm that's going to inter interrupt uh, the, the service or, or, or maybe cause the attendance. And, and by the way, when we pray that people will come so the attendance will be good, doesn't have anything to do with the offerings. The offerings are good whether people come or not in this church. But it's necessary that people come here and be fortified with the word of God. So why should we have a storm on Sunday if we could have one on Saturday or on Monday and have Sunday sun shining so the sun shining so we can come and hear the word so we know how to brave the elements on Monday. Amen. Salvation carries with it the idea of protection. That was one instance. Amen. That famous account, protection, physical preservation from harm. I'm trying to remember the story we one young man was in was with us when we were in Peace Hall, and he was going home, I think, and he was about to be mugged. And I I, I don't remember the words he said, but he said, you, you can't do that or something in the name of Jesus. And all these young men ran, ran from him as if in terror. You know why Ricky Green did that? Was he all that brave? No. We had been preaching in those days that the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him. And Ricky Green simply got a hold of that truth and took the shield of faith. Didn't wait for somebody to give him the shield of faith, but took the shield of faith and be declared and believed that the name of Jesus was superior to any other force or principality or area of authority. So he took authority of that corner in Teaneck that night, and they had to leave. Now, why am I preaching it to you? Because you are walking back and forth through all kinds, much more dangerous situations perhaps than even he encountered that night, going back and forth. Well, just read the papers. I mean, guy, guy burns his own self up on the subway, getting ready to burn other, and, 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 and 40 some people with him. Another guy shoots up the Long Island River. You can't go anywhere today and depend on your own ability to protect yourself or the police or anybody else. You better have faith in the helmet of salvation to protect you from physical harm. Amen. And the only way you're going to believe for that is to know that God promised it. That is the promise of scripture. Salvation. Everlasting life. Protection, preservation, wholeness. That's what the word means. Are you saved? If you're saved, that's what you have. If that's what you have, that's what you need to believe for. And I'll tell you another thing. You can talk faith. You can talk faith good. Everybody can talk faith. Once you get the language down, you can talk that stuff. I mean, we like to talk it, you know, and, and quote scripture. 
until the situation smacks you in the face and then you're standing in the middle of it. And suddenly your confidence, if it isn't in the word of God, is going to be shaken and so will you be shaken. And you will run and seek the world's methods of solving the situation. You got to be convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that what this word says. And the only way to be convinced is have it reinforced, 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 reinforced. Go out of here, take the tape, play it in your car, go in, come in, do research on the scriptures yourself until it lodges in your spirit. It's the only way it works. Amen. Look at Luke, the first chapter. In Luke, the first chapter, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, prophesied. Starting in the first chapter of Luke in the 67th verse, it says, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. We're going to be protected because God will remember his holy covenant and the promises he made to those that have gone before us. He's promised to protect us. You listening? Now, turn to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. I want to move along here. I hate to rush because I may jump over some things that you need to know. So I'm going to take my time. I don't finish tonight. I'll finish next time. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. The Apostle Paul informs us in this second letter to the church at uh, Corinth, in verse number four, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And the strongholds he's referring here to here are the principalities, are the areas of authority in the heavens ranged around us, demonic authority, strongholds. Casting down, I want you to notice something here now. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He informs us that although we live in the natural realm, we are not to fight the powers that be with natural weapons because our weapons are not natural, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of spiritual strongholds, the pulling down of principalities, the pulling down of powers, the pulling down of uh, rulers of darkness, the pulling down of wicked spirits in the spirit realm. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 establishes that any man who is in Christ is a new creature. He says old things. What does that mean? Old methods, old ways, old weapons, old net nature has passed away, and all, all things are new. New ways, new methods, new weapons, new nature to combat these things that come against us in the spirit realm. So this is the reason why this nation, the United States, always has allowed for what they call conscientious objectors. A conscientious objector is a person who is opposed by religious reasons or reasons of conscience to violence. But this country has allowed them to serve in the military in time of war in non-combative yet supportive roles, like in the medical uh, service or something like that. And I need to make this, emphasize this because it's a point that is not often emphasized. It is not the role of the body of Christ in this earth to advocate violence against anybody. You hear me? It's not our role to advocate violence. In the Persian Gulf War, it was true that Hussein deserved everything he got, but it was not the position of the church 
you listening? Was not the position of the church to demand that they go in there and do away with him. How do you know that somebody might not get to him one day and get him saved? And you just ordered his demise. You listening? Something you need to think about. What does John 3.16 say? God so loved the United States and the Western powers and everybody that agrees politically with us. He said, God so loved the world. If God so loves the world, we haven't got it. no business ordering their physical demise. I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the government. When you're a government official, you have to do what the official policy of your government is to protect your country. All right? But as the body of Christ, no preacher, no minister has the right to get in any pulpit and suggest that any group of people be done away with. We have the responsibility to get in the pulpit and, and encourage believers to pray. Pray for Hussein. Pray for Zirinovsky over there in Russia. Pray for what, anybody else you can think of that, you know, is a, is a terrible person and is advocating, you know, whatever. Pray for the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina or whatever the places over there killing each other with, with ethnic. Pray for them. They are souls that need to be saved. Pray that God will get somebody in there. Some of those UN forces, somebody. After all, Paul was in jail between a quaternion of soldiers. And what he had to say was carried all over the world by those soldiers because he told it to them. Amen? You listening? Lord, I don't have any more time. All right, but let me just finish this. I said it's not the role of the body of Christ in the earth to advocate violence. The body of Christ, with the knowledge of the spiritual arsenal and faith, can grow up to, into the realization that we have more power than that of tanks and missiles and guns. And I, I'll, I'll leave you with this statement. We must obey all government authority until that authority attempts to supersede the authority of God. And then that's when we obey God. All right? And one other thing. I've got five minutes. The helmet of salvation also has to do with physical and bodily salvation. Turn to James 5 real quick. We can get that in. James 5. This is the scripture that talks about, are there any sick among you? James 5. It says, is any among you, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall do what to the sick? The prayer of faith will save the sick, and that word also means heal. So salvation and healing are synonymous in this sense. The sick will be saved when they're healed, all right? And the Lord, who's going to raise him up? The Lord will raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. With salvation came healing or physical preservation. Now, the prayer of faith is the prayer prayed in faith, not prayed in hope, not prayed snotting and crying, not knowing whether. The prayer of faith is a prayer, absolutely confident prayer, prayed according to the word of God in the situation. It's not your responsibility to heal the person. It's your responsibility to pray in faith. And I'll tell you something else. If they die, your best bet is to say next and pray for the next person in faith, believing that they will be healed because it's not our responsibility to heal them. It's God's responsibility. And if God chooses not to, we he, maybe we'll find out by and by and after a while and maybe we won't. But our responsibility is still to continue to pray in faith because it's what the word requires of us. And not to ask why and get all discouraged because, well, so-and-so and so-and-so, Serena didn't make it. So what if Serena didn't make it? Serena is home with Jesus, where we're all going to wind up. Why didn't she get here? I don't know. Don't ask me. But the next prayer I pray is going to be a prayer believing that God will do what he said he will do in the same circumstance. For the same condition. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The prayer of faith is the prayer prayed in faith based on 
a promise in Scripture. In this verse, the sick are advised to call the elders of the church not to stay home and pout. The elders of the church will pray the prayer of faith. The elders of the church will anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and it is the Lord that will raise them up when the prayer is prayed in faith. And also, we also learn that the elders are not the only one that can pray the prayer of faith. The one who's sick can pray the prayer of faith. That's why we send tapes to people. That's why we, if they can't read, they can listen. Amen. If they're, if they're able to sit up and read, we give them something to read. And don't let unbelieving people in, get, go in there and talk all that un, unbelieving, stupid stuff to them about they don't look good. Neither do you most of the time. <laughs> At least they're sick. What's your excuse? <laughs> but people are stupid. People come into the sick person's room, you know, and, and look at them and, oh. <laughs> Gee, that's encouraging. Or send them some dumb card. Get well. Get well. I'm already healed. I was healed at Calvary. I don't need to get well. I need the manifestation to occur. Amen? I'm not sick. Now, people get in a lot of trouble when you start talking like that, you know? And don't fight with the doctors. The doctor... Come on now. If you went to the hospital, if you went to the hospital, don't sit up there and argue with the doctor because what he ought to do is say, why did you come? If you had all that faith, why aren't you home in your house believing the word of God and bothering me? I could be dealing with another patient. So do what he says or, 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 or get healed by the word of God, but don't give him a hard time. He's doing what he's trained to do and what he's getting paid to do, you know? I don't receive that. You know, his attitude is, what do you want me to do? Take it, don't take it, you know? There's a scripture that says, if you have faith, have it to yourself. There are times when you need to shut up and say, all right, doctor, thank you. I know you've done all you can do. I appreciate your help, you know, but this is between me and God. They'll understand that. That happened to me. I was in the hospital with a dissecting aneurysm, supposed to be dead. We told the doctor, there's something about this case you don't know. That's I'm a born again Christian. I have no tubes and stuff belong in me. And the doctor looked at me and said, well, if you believe God to that extent, go with it. And he got up and went on about his business. I was out of the hospital without the operation. Praise God. The helmet of salvation carries with it physical healing. That's all I'm going to talk about tonight. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah.